سلام میکنم به شما آقای جف باردین خیلی ممنون که دعوت ما رو پذیرفتید برای این گفتگو We really started following um, Iranian activities at the beginning of their, their uh, uh, I guess, the genesis of their hacking activities, starting with groups like Ashiani uh, Digital Security and others, and following in their, their forums, uh, tracking their activities, tracking their, how they learned and built things, how they started uh, offering their own firewalls, teaching their own classes, holding their own information security courses, teaching hacking, uh, talking at... various universities around uh, Iran, including Sharif University. Um, many of these folks uh, taking classes then at these locations. Uh, so we started in the early days following them when there was the hacking that they were performing was uh, defacements and in kind of low level. And over the years followed their capabilities through the advent of Stuxnet and how the Iranian regime shifted at that time into uh, a different perspective, making it a national imperative to create cyber operations capabilities, both defensive as well as offensive. So it's been years of following them, tracking them, uh, watching them, to the point where uh, we've been able to identify some of the, the hackers to the point where we know uh, where they go to uh, work out at fitness centers, what time they go, what potential routes they might take, take uh, what they paid for their apartments and what cars they're driving. So we, we follow to that degree as much as we can with the available information. And uh, it's, it's been following this historical growth and capability to the point where uh, they're now well honed, honed and uh, driven operation that is uh, controlled by uh, the highest uh, echelons of the regime. In the early days, uh, the regime didn't pay much attention to them. Uh, but uh, I'd have to say that Stuxnet was a turning point where A lot of these folks that were freelance hackers were being co-opted and, uh, and given ultimatums to participate or, or uh, something else may happen. So it's been a, it's been a long haul with them, but it's, uh, it's happened fairly quickly. Um, but in Internet years, that, uh, that can be pretty short. But it's been very interesting to follow them over the years how they've gone from Sure. So the, the first part, the unsuspecting users, in any social media uh, sites, whether it's a Facebook, a Twitter, a Telegram, there's a lot of people looking for some alignment and they start to friend or follow uh, different accounts out there and they'll look for accounts that have a large following. And uh, a lot of these accounts will push out certain keywords, phrases, hashtags, per se, that seem relatively benign and non-threatening. And uh, they start to get emotionally attached in some cases to these accounts. So when these accounts start uh, pushing out these keywords or phrases, they just repeat them uh, without thought. Uh, we see this with uh, a, a lot of repetition on, on Facebook where people will just repeat memes uh, just because it seems to align with, with what they believe. Uh, we get into a confirmation bias, right? We only want to follow things that... Uh, we believe ourselves, and therefore it must be right, and anything outside of that causes what we call cognitive dissonance, something that uh, gives us a bad feeling about something, so we just don't follow it. So a lot of these folks will follow regime accounts on, on Twitter and just blindly repeat uh, this information, and the more it gets repeated, they get followed, they get more followers, and Uh, in the end of the, in the game, it's, uh, it's all about the number of followers you have, the number of likes you have. So folks will just repeat this without even considering what the content is or what the target is uh, or what the intent is of the originator of, of this information. In addition, we saw a lot of the, uh, the content come out and using uh, swear words and, and calling uh, uh, folks uh, bad names to try and repeat those bad names over and over again. We've seen this in U.S. politics as well. where uh, names are, uh, are used against someone and it sticks, and this is a derogatory term, and it's hard to uh, become separate from that term when it's repeated all the time. So uh, it's a phenomenon that's come, uh, that's come full force with respect to social media uh, uh, platforms, and we saw this in this campaign on Twitter. 
Now, when it comes to the Dunbar's number, it's an interesting concept. The Dunbar's number is a theory that the human mind uh, cognitively can only manage about 150 friends. And uh, as I apply this uh, to a, what we call the circle of trust and the Dunbar's number, you look at the Dunbar's number and say, okay, uh, this started from a core trusted group, a small group of, of uh, regime uh, operatives acting on Twitter who released some information to trigger the campaign. And then another concentric circle of trust was released, and another, and another, and another. And we target this up to about 147, just by chance. That fits the Dunbar's number of 100, about approximately 150. Now, this is a theory uh, that's been around for quite some time. The other part of this is if you compare this to uh, mafia, U.S. mafia-type activities, and if you've ever watched uh, movies like The Godfather, they always start with a central figure, a central core figure that has trusted folks around them and a small trusted group. And then, uh, so you have a don, and then you have a consigliere, the counselor who counsels the don, and then you'll have an underboss. And then from the underboss, you have multiple different capos and captains. And then under that, you have soldiers. And then another circle is soldiers, you have associates. And as you f go further and further out of the circle of trust, that Dunbar's number, uh, there's less information flow, but they just respond with blind obedience. And we saw that representative in the activities of this campaign, how it was triggered with an initial net call and how they responded uh, in sequence uh, as if a trigger to get ready for the, uh, for the event. So that's the, the, the concept of the Dunbar's number, the cognitive limitations, and then the alignment of that to mafia-type organizations and how they maintain trust in the center, and they release information out and instructions, and, and that information goes out. And each centric circle knows the outer one, and maybe the outer one doesn't know the inner. So it, it maintains a level of trust and security and removes some risk uh, from the organization that way. چطوری این رو با این قطعیت میخواستم خلاصه توضیح بدین که چطوری با این قطعیت به این نتیجه رسیدین و فرق چنین کمپینی با اون چی که بهش میگیم فلش ما به سایبری چی هست؟ Well, historically, we've seen um, these besieged resistance groups inside of Iran, in and around Tehran. There's there's a, a group of them. Matter of fact, at the end of the report, there's a bunch of links that take you back to our blog site, the cybershafarat.com, that actually uh, leads you to information about these resistance groups, about the besieged training and activities. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But how we knew this was uh, aligned to them is we started looking at uh, frequencies and timelines of, of tweets and how they aligned into different uh, anonymous uh, chat bots on Telegram for what we assume to be um, uh, anonymous communications, confidential communications. But when the initial trigger came, uh, uh, that aligned directly to the July 17 um, Congress so that you have the online conference, um, it started taking shape, and we saw the triggers come from uh, from some of the leads in this, and and then we saw what we call a net call. Having spent years in, in the military, we would, uh, and also uh, as a, a signals intelligence analyst and, and collector back in many years ago, when uh, an activity is about to start, you push out what's called a net call, and that net call is to signify that everybody is aware of uh, some information that's going to be passed, an operation is going to start, and everybody has to call into that net call in sequence. Now, we listed that in the report on page 11. There's an image of that net call, and, and it follows through in structure, and that's where you start pulling in those 147 different accounts uh, that ties back into the Dunbar's number in that mafioso-style circle of trust. So uh, that was very clear. It was very clearly laid out. They all repeated, uh, or most of them repeated largely the same hashtags as an acknowledgement of the net call that they're ready to go. And this occurred uh, on the 15th and then through uh, early hours of the 16th of July as preparation for their campaign on the 17th, where their intent was to uh, flood the airways with negative information uh, about, um, about the mech. So uh, we followed that. Uh, oh, we didn't follow this right off the bat. This came after we started seeing this massive spike in activity, which was huge. You see that a chart of that as well on, on page 11. 
And then the repetition of the negative hashtags over and over again that we've seen in the past that lines up also uh, to sites like Najat and others out there that are, are uh, regime managed and driven. And it started making sense. So as we dug into the data, and there was a massive amounts of data that we had to pull in uh, from um, the different social media sites, uh, primarily Twitter, that allowed us to analyze and track and break the data down enough into uh, we could get rid of the noise and see what was happening. The other thing we saw was that the leadership, after triggering these, some of the leadership, they, they largely sat back and watched the activities and would redirect some of the comments uh, and some of the hashtags. Um, and, and why is that uh, interesting and why is that important to an operation like this? In any deception operation, the deceiver, in this case the regime, must have uh, access or views into the target, that would be the, the mech in this case, and the people responding to this, to see how they're responding so they can adjust the deception campaign. And that's a feedback loop. So we saw them adjusting and shifting throughout the 60 hours of this activity and the 111,000 plus tweets uh, that they pushed out to drown out any messaging that came out from, uh, from the online Congress. It was very clear this occurred. There was even uh, comments uh, and a few arguments between some of the leadership as to who could have these uh, decisions and make the decisions, which helped us define their leadership. And, uh, and then afterwards, that uh, helped define this even more, is that uh, some of the same leadership in their Twitter accounts started changing the names of their Twitter accounts, started privatizing their Twitter accounts. Uh, so we know that um, we, we pretty much were on target with this because of their reactions afterwards. We call this lots of times second and third order effects. And we can watch, uh, it's like throwing a stone in a, in a pond and there's a first ripple, but then there's multiple different ripples afterwards and you monitor those to see what the changes are. So we're quite certain as to uh, the, the leadership and where this came from. Uh, and and uh, it also ties back to the uh, besieged resistant councils and their training. And that training uh, ties into the fact that they have uh, virtual ch uh, gender changes in their personas online. Uh, they fake to be men and women. Mostly they'll have uh, fake to be younger women to try and attract men. They change uh, their their hashtags. They have avatars that look just like the one the lion and the sun flag as well. So they uh, anything they can do to infiltrate their targets to uh, cause chaos and and. Uh, confusion and to create uh, a negative connotation against their targets uh, is, is key to uh, an influence operation. Well, the, the siege cyber activities, I mentioned a little bit about that, how they, they train them to, um, what we've seen is, uh, first of all, they have a, a, an initial document that's kind of an enrollment document for students. And they have the students fill out this enrollment document. And we've posted that as well off of the uh, Cyber Shafarat site. The actual uh, document is there. And that's one of the links at the end of the report. Uh, if you go to cybershafarat.com and search on Besiege, uh, that will come up. Or also, you can follow the links in the end of the report. But what they're looking for is they, they track the national ID numbers, the national codes, dates of birth, marital statuses, uh, education, their religious preferences, uh, academic levels. They're trying to filter out who they think would be trustworthy and follow the revolutionary ideals. And they're trying to get them to uh, uh, align so they can uh, um, mobilize them when they need to. They talk about the relationships to any martyrs they may have in the family. Uh, they talk about their skill sets in cyberspace, writing, poetry, um, political uh, views, history, literature, uh, phys ed, journalism, photography, anything, because they're trying to build a multifaceted approach to uh, and capabilities to their uh, besieged cyber battalions and cyber council groups. What they also do is if they find some that are that are highly technical, they'll move them on to different, uh, different groups where into more hacking type groups, more technical areas. They'll take the young, though, and they'll use them for low-paid jobs to actually propagate information across the internet, internet that just floods the internet with positive uh, information about the Iranian regime. 
So this uh, indoctrination starts with an application. They'll invite them to training centers where they teach them how to uh, operate and influence operations, create LinkedIn accounts, Twitter accounts, and hide without being uh, without saying anything that's going to get them possibly kicked off uh, the site. Um, but also um, to constantly propagate that positive information about the regime and attack dissidents with negative information uh, globally. So, and it's looking to recruit the young and get them early and uh, get them involved in, in supporting the regime through the cyber arena. And then uh, they train them. There's been uh, different uh, mobilization areas, and we've posted this online as well. There's uh, over a dozen of them. They're besieged resistance areas in and around Tehran, and, and we assume that they also exist uh, in other cities. So you see uh, besiege resistance forces, uh, Quds Besiege Area 5, per se, and, and we've posted this online actually with the names and email addresses and some of the phone numbers of those who participate in those resistance areas. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very interesting. They, they're trying to uh, equip themselves to fight against anything they believe is negative and contrary, and they stand by and at the ready after their training to participate in operations such as this campaign. And they're called upon to do it, and they're given instructions, and then they propagate the message um, of this campaign. And then when they're told to stop and cease, and everything uh, slows down, uh, they, they stop the operation. This was a 60 uh, hours of activity. So uh, they've got management uh, that manages over the top of them, and then they may have ties into the IRGC or the MOIS as well, where they get their instructions through usually a single person. So we've been able to confirm this by having direct conversations with um, hackers and uh, others inside of Iran who've come forward, and, and not to be named, but who've confirmed our, our thoughts on this. And yes, there's a potential for uh, deception, but we already had the documents, so we're actually looking to confirm them. And we did get that confirmation. So this is a well-honed, well-oiled operation, very well-structured and led and managed, and uh, I'm sure we're going to see more of it. Investigation shows that we were we were spot on with with our uh, most of our analysis. I mean, there's still some that uh, in any type of collection analysis, this type you're never going to get all the data. It's fragmented, but the analysis, the inductive deductive reasoning, and the inferences that you come forward and you analyze uh, give us a strong indication, a high confidence of this that this was definitely a.